and welcome to Out of the Fog. I'm Lynn Hammond. Tonight, my guest is Kevin Casey, partner with Cal Legro Insurance. Sales, insurance, how exciting can that be? Stay tuned to find out. Join us after these messages. You're watching Rogers TV St. John's. Watching Rogers TV St. John's. And we're back with Kevin Casey of Cal Legro Insurance. It feels so funny to say Cal Legro Insurance. You know, <laughs> I, I guess, you know, I first met you when you were with the Idea Factory, but do you remember when we first met? I remember this. Was it, um, it wasn't the Sundance it, dance it was, floor? No, it was, it was gypsy networking opportunity. Yeah, at, uh, at the Gypsy Tea Room. And you had a yellow business card. Yes, yes, very bad. And, and you later made me a new one. But I remember, uh, I remember it because I had heard your name for so long in the marketing world. And, you know, you had done work for my dad with the dairy farmers. Mm. And, you know, yeah. I mean, you were the marketing guy, right? And so uh, I remember I went, oh, you're Kevin Casey. So then you looked around, you, you looked around, you saw a five foot eight, 210 pound man and said, that's Kevin Casey. I know. So, I mean, you know, people, you know, we're talking about kind of the great reset now, people doing different things in work, you yeah. know, that sort of thing. I mean, you made your own big change, you know, I guess it was seven or eight years ago. So, you know, yeah. let's just start with telling our viewers a little bit about you. I mean, if they live in St. John's, they might know you already. They but. might, but I'll try to make this. This is, you know, I pity you sitting in that seat having asked people that because sometimes I ask people that question and I get like a 15, 20 minute answer. I'm dehydrated, I'm tired. <laughs> so I'll give you the on cringy version. Perfect. Um, you know, I've got two brothers and a sister. Mom want one of us to go to medical school. She mm -hmm. was really hoping someone would. Uh, the closest I got was my sister became a nurse. Mm -hmm. I ended up a sales guy, obviously not the golden child. <laughs> she still loves me, not overly proud of me. Yeah. Um, and you know, I started out in sales uh, my whole life. In, um, I did the beer business mm -hmm. in 97 and 98. Mm -hmm. Then myself and Ed Roach actually created the Idea Factory, which mm -hmm. is where we met. That was in 2001 and that was in a basement in Logie Bay. Mm -hmm. And we literally cut out business cards as we went along. Amazing. And we had, I had a coffee table and he had a computer and we kind of grew that. Uh, I stayed there for 16 years. It was an incredible run we had. Mm -hmm. And then I think I shocked even some members of my own family, my circle, <laughs> that in 2016, uh, Jeff Legro and Rod mm -hmm. Batcher, who were clients, uh, invited me into the ownership team uh, to a place that I never thought I would go, mm -hmm. which if someone said you were going to be an insurance guy, I would have been shocked. Well, like to me, it's like the most exciting guy goes to the most boring business. I mean, it, it really was it kind of like, it looked like that. It would look like that to the outside. Yeah. But that to me was part of the challenge. Mm -hmm. So uh, I actually think what's shocking to me is I sit through the last six years at Caligro it's every bit as exciting as Idea Factory, and I mean yeah. that. And yeah. there's parts of the Idea Factory I truly miss, yeah. okay? Uh, the ironic thing is, when you want to go and show a logo to somebody, mm -hmm. 800 people from the company show up. <laughs> when you talk about insurance, <laughs> you got to beg someone to come in the room. My point is, like, insurance is actually protecting the reputation of companies. Yes. It's actually protecting mm -hmm. bad things when they happen, protecting you. So to me, um, I've actually found it totally interesting. 
and being uncomfortable, mm -hmm. and we've talked about this before, oh, yes. Lynn. Yeah. Being uncomfortable is is probably uh, where I do my best work, and yeah. I think it was time. The Idea Factory is doing even better without Kevin Casey, mm -hmm. and uh, you know I'm enjoying uh, what I'm doing at Caligro. We're growing a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it looks boring, but my job is to make it way less boring. I mean, so. I grew up listening, you know, to the Dale Carnegie tapes. Right. Uh, you know, the, like, you know, my dad would have them on in the car. Um, right. You know, of course, you know my dad, you know, dressed right. like a, you know, stick of chewing gum all the time, right? Yeah. You know, that old school business right. sales kind of approach. Um, and when you got to, to Cal, you kind of, kind of flipped upside down the way you do things. Um, you yeah. know, so... And we, you, you talked to me yesterday about unselling. You know, yeah. about, so, so let's just talk well, about that a little bit. Unselling is a word that came to my mind a long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing I did realize when I went into the insurance space is I was actually surrounded by people who were what I call reluctant sellers. People who are very good at what they do, mm -hmm. but as soon as they actually got to try to sell that, they go from human to cyborg. And I never yeah. understood why yeah. people change who they are when they sell. Mm -hmm. I'm the same person at 8 o'clock at night than I am as I'm here with you right now. So what happens with salespeople is companies hire people who are extroverts mm -hmm. and enthusiastic people, which sometimes actually creates sales resistance. They throw salespeople into a dark room. They mm -hmm. make them watch product training tapes for two days. Then after waterboarding them for two days, they go out into the world and they vomit all over people <laughs> about how great their product is and how great we are and please buy from us. And you wonder why people are afraid of salespeople. Mm -hmm. It's because they're not trained properly. Yeah. So um, I had to take reluctant sellers who I really respected and I saw them work mm -hmm. and I just had to get them to understand you don't need to be pushy and salesy and sleazy mm -hmm. to sell. Mm -hmm. You actually got to be a problem solver and not a product pusher. Because you and don't want to come off as sales, right? I mean, no one you wants know, to. when you get that, oh, can I help you? Or, you know, hi, how are you today? I've got, you, you know, we're, we're, we're even trained. Uh, you had said this to me before. We're, we're trained to, that it's okay to lie to salespeople. Like, you, you, <laughs> you can still, you can still go to heaven if you lie to a salesperson. You can't lie to an engineer. You can't lie to a teacher. Don't lie to your mom. <laughs> lie to a salesperson. That's okay. Come on in. Yeah. So let me throw it back at you, Lynn. Say you're looking for. You got great boots on today. Say you're looking for another pair of cool boots. Mm -hmm. You go into the store. You want shoes. Mm -hmm. You are there for boots. Right. So you are there to solve a pain in your mind. Yes. A salesperson is spotted coming in the corner of your eye. And they come over and say, can I help you? What do you say? No, thanks. I'm just browsing. <laughs> so the point is we have been trained yep. from our parents and our grandparents that you, ca you had to lie to a salesperson because you just want their space. Yeah. So if I call Lynn Hammond and say, hey, Lynn, it's Kevin Casey calling from Caligro. How are you doing today? You know I'm a salesperson. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the idea is to pattern interrupt yeah. that and be human. Be yourself. So, be you. So, so, I mean, what does that shoe, shoe salesperson, what are they supposed to do? Or what, what's an alternative? Well, you know? alternative would be when I think of my daughter, Olivia, who was mm -hmm. spending a fortune on sneakers when she was playing Competitive tennis. Mm -hmm. We were up in Calgary. We're at this uh, mall, and I hate shopping malls. Mm -hmm. I don't like shopping. Um, my wife was in there, myself and Olivia going to a sports store. She's looking at a wall of sneakers. And the salesperson had a pattern interrupt. She could have came over, and if she had said, do you guys need any help? We would have said, no, we're just browsing. Same as what you yeah. did. But she said, first of all, she made it about us, so she put us as the hero. She said, you guys must be up here in the big tennis tournament. How's it going? And we're like, oh, it's going pretty good, thanks. Mm -hmm. And where are you from? What province? Newfoundland. And then she talked a little bit about that. So no selling. Pressure comes down. So we got a mm -hmm. force field up. Now the pressure's coming down. And they said, you know, has your daughter ever had a gait test? G-A-I-T, didn't know the word. 
salespeople don't do this, so I was, I don't know what you mean. Mm -hmm. She said, well, a gait test measures the pronation of the foot, and your daughter's playing a lot of tennis, obviously, on a hard surface. If you want, we have a little treadmill with 18 cameras, and we can kind of get just a view of your daughter's stride. It measures your stride length. So I thought it was pretty cool. Olivia wanted to jump on a treadmill and have electrodes on her body mm -hmm. and ears. <laughs> and we go through it, and 10 minutes later, she showed me that Olivia has a pronation on her stride, and those sneakers may be the right ones and may not be the right ones. But there's a special cut of her sneaker that will prevent her from having injury. Mm -hmm. Now, they just took something as boring as sneakers and they made it emotional. So in my mind, am I a good father if I, my daughter's in the wrong sneakers? Mm -hmm. uh, what do I do? Do I tell Linda that, you know, they're cool sneakers, but they're not for her feet? So I said, I'd like to know a little bit more. She educates me. Mm -hmm. The next thing you know, I spent $180 on sneakers. Yeah. But I never felt like I was sold to. So people love to buy, but they hate to be sold to. Mm -hmm. And I never felt like I was sold to. Mm -hmm. She educated me, and she made it emotional. And if there's no emotion, there's no sale. And so it's about finding the problem, solving a problem. It can be solving the problem, but oftentimes people don't know there is a problem. Yeah. We did not have a problem with an MP3 player until Steve Jobs put up a thousand songs in our pocket. Yeah. We didn't know we had a taxi problem until someone said, press a button, and three minutes later, a car shows up and picks you up. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you gotta share something that you know that they don't know, and then you just lean back. Mm -hmm. And if they're interested, great, and if they're not, Perfect, you move on. There's 7.6 billion people in the world. Disqualify fast, but don't push. This disqualify fast is really interesting to me, and it really goes along with not taking things personally and not feeling rejected. Right. Because I think that's probably a big issue 100%. for people in sales, is yeah. that feeling of rejection. Nobody wants to be rejected. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that acceptance of like, Fail fast. Cut. It's very counterintuitive. Um, you know, I wish I knew this in 2010. I didn't. I mm -hmm. was a big people pleaser mm -hmm. salesperson. So I was, if I was a dog as a salesperson, I was a dog that would chase the ball. Yeah. And I would hustle and I would work. Yeah. But that's not healthy either. Because mm -hmm. then you don't have the courage to disqualify. So you don't need to be rude to disqualify. If I didn't want that gate test done on Olivia's sneakers, mm -hmm. I think she would have been fine. Mm -hmm. I just didn't want to know it. Yeah. But as a dad, I felt like I had a responsibility to know if Olivia had the right sneakers. Yeah. And she educated me, and I never felt sold. But rejection is a big deal. But here's the mindset change, Lynn, and I'll say for you or anyone else who has to sell. You gotta detach yourself from the outcome. Mm -hmm. And if you start treating it as a conversation, like we're having, yeah. and not a sales call, you're gonna feel less pressure inside, and when you feel less pressure, you come off with less pressure. It just happens. Yeah. So, like, let's say um, you or one of your colleagues, uh, so let's just say it's you, um, you know, call me, my company, about insurance, and I yeah. say, you know what, thanks so much, you know, I, I'm covered, you know, I've got insurance. Yeah. So, you know, how do you, do you just say thank you? Like, do you, where does it, how, how quickly do you accept the no? Like, what's the... First of all, I'm so detached from the outcome, I don't actually attach my self-worth to the things. The only thing right. I can control yeah. is to bring something new. So, let's pretend we're doing it. Okay. Seriously, so... Yeah. I'm calling and say, hey, Lynn, it's Kevin Casey. We haven't chatted before. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to hang up now or would you give me 30 seconds? <laughs> and you're probably going to laugh because yeah. salespeople would never say... <laughs> wouldn't say that. That, but right. I would say that. Yes, you would. <laughs> because I've learned the other way that if I call and say, hey, Lynn, it's Kevin Casey. How you doing today? <laughs> you're I'm sorry, I have a meeting starting in five minutes. Exactly, so yeah. I'll call it out and if someone... Yeah. I've, I don't think I've got hung up on yet. I don't do that all the time, by the yeah. way. But someone, some people may yeah. say, um, you know, I'm with 
this company. Okay. We're so all set. I, you know, I. So if I say, you know what, I've been with, uh, you know, a company for a while. You know, I, I think I'm good. Thanks. Yeah. And listen, uh, I know a bunch of people over there. They're mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how long have you guys been dating? <laughs> Uh, I guess 10 years. 10 years, okay. Yeah. So is it like happily married <laughs> or is it kind of like living together and good enough? Uh, probably just living together because I don't know a whole lot about, about them. But I so think So now just... I would dig into that okay. and say, so why doesn't it feel like happily married anymore? Uh, and you search for the pain yeah. and you search for something, yeah. but yeah. it's up to me yeah. to bring something to the yeah. table. Yeah, well, I, I look at it, you know what, I've got to have insurance and I've got it, so it's just one of those things I don't really think about. Right, so here's the thing with insurance, and you said this at the very beginning of the interview, you said, how did you go something so boring? So let me tell you, there is nobody that wants to meet with Kevin Casey about insurance. Just true, it's just, mm -hmm. they don't want, you don't wake up, a business owner, mm -hmm. we mostly do businesses, Right. They do not wake up with an insurance problem. They do not get out of bed saying, I have an insurance problem. They get up and say, I have a payroll problem. Uh, maybe I gotta let someone go problem. Uh, how do I win that new account problem? How do I get through another week of 50% capacity problem? They're not waking up with an insurance problem. Mm -hmm. So it's actually up to me to create some kind of tension. And I can tell you, I've sat down with every smart business owner in my circle and when I ask them, no camera rolling, over a bear, mm. do you really understand if you're covered for what you should be covered for? Truly, just look at me. Yeah. No, no idea. So they said, well, I hope I'm covered. And I said, well, I hope they pay out. I mean, you gotta create some pain. And unless you do that, people are just gonna say, I don't have an insurance problem. And they don't. The real Until they have a problem. And so insurance is that thing that you never want to talk about till something bad happens. Right. And then it's all they can talk about. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. Yeah. So if there's no pain, it's not there. The onus is on me to bring something I know that you don't know. So if you own a building and I know that building supply materials have gone up by 50%, mm -hmm. yet the value of your business on your insurance is the same. Now we create a tension. Yeah. Now, I don't do it for scaremongering, but yeah, I, no, I would say, listen, as you know, steel, drywall, building materials have gone up. How are you making sure that your building's insured at the right value in case, the rare case that something bad happens? And you lean back and you let people sit on that and they either react to it and they wanna know more or they don't. And if they don't wanna know more, it's okay. I hoped I helped them think about it a little bit differently yeah. so they can have a conversation with their broker. And that's it. And it took me a long while to get to that point where I didn't feel like I had to sell mm. because there was a point I had commission breath mm. and it usually starts with we or I. Yeah. If people look at their websites, even their websites, and they took a yellow marker and put down all the I's and we's and then took mm. a green highlighter and picked all the things that was about your customer, you would have a sea of yellow. People have become product pushers. Yeah. And I just wanna bring something to the table that gets them to get emotional. Cause it doesn't matter if it's a piece of gum, a house or insurance policy or a new pair of shoes, you will say you bought it for logical reasons, but you bought it for emotional reasons. Mm -hmm. Just like my friend who got the sports car. Mm -hmm. He'll say the JD Power ratings are incredible. It's a short summer in Newfoundland. I need it, mm -hmm. a sports car, and it drives so well. <laughs> the real reason is because he wanted to feel young again, and he wanted to feel a little cool. Mm -hmm. But he'll justify it with the JD Power rating. Mm -hmm. We're humans. Mm -hmm. We're we are emotional beings, and it doesn't matter what you're selling. So you got a little emotional one day at uh, the business and arts meeting and they were talking mm. about uh, bringing in a, a special speaker and you know, you thought, oh, let's bring in <laughs> Seth, <laughs> yeah. Seth Godin. And you, you know, instead of kind of just, you know, taking that, that punch, 
uh, you dug in and went after it. Why don't you share that with us? Because that's, that's a that really a, cool story, Kevin. Well, yeah, I mean, we go after the same very talented people here all the time, right? Yeah. So if your first name is Alan, there's two of you who always get picked on in Newfoundland yeah. Labrador to speak. Uh, if your name is Mark, you're probably gonna get asked yeah. to do a lot too. Um, you know, Business and Arts NL was about creative people and business people coming together to solve problems in mm -hmm. different ways. And they, we wanted to bring in a speaker and sometimes I say things I regret and you know, your, your mouth speaks first and I said we need someone like Seth Godin. And it got a lot of smirks, a lot of funny looks, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes spite is a great motivator for me. <laughs> okay, so um, I said, what the hell? And I probably worked three hours on an email. I didn't know Seth Godin, never met him. For people that don't know him, I mean, he's written 19 books. Mm -hmm. uh, he's probably got the top, one of the top five blogs on the planet. Mm -hmm. And if you Google Seth, yeah. You're, you know you've made it when you can Google Seth and you're number one, okay? So he's, he's a good guy. I had no right to email him, okay? Or even reach out to him. But I did, because that's sometimes what I do. And uh, I worked about three hours on this email. I used a lot of the on-selling principles mm -hmm. within that email, so it wasn't a hustle. Mm -hmm. I actually talked about the commonalities between New York, where he's from, and Gander, and that mm -hmm. story, and the common bond that we share with New York. I basically told him uh, we had no budget, so it was an absolutely humbling disclaimer. Uh, I told him what Business Arts was about and how we, I felt Newfoundland and Labrador needed someone like Seth Godin to speak. And then I basically gave him an easy out, saying, I know you're probably not gonna do this, but I love what you're doing and keep doing what you do. And I thought I'd never hear from him. 53 minutes later, I got an email, which I thought was spam. <laughs> Uh, from him, and he basically waived his fifty thousand dollar fee. And it was actually him. Like it was actually him. So Kevin, like really, why do you think Seth said yes? Like what was it about your email or that connection that made him say yes? Same thing. What would have got you to buy shoes? So Seth Godin gets hundreds of emails a day. Yeah. Uh, he got what Business Arts was about. He knew I wasn't hustling him. Mm -hmm. He knew I understood his world, and we made a common connection, and I didn't push it, so he was curious. And that mm -hmm. curiosity got us in the door. I wasn't needy. Interesting, interesting. And there was no pressure, right? Yeah. Zero pressure. Well, yeah, You know. I guess, but. The only pressure came when I had the interview, and that was the toughest <laughs> interview of my life. So let's talk about Colombo. I read uh, one of your posts on Columbo. LinkedIn. And uh, it was just really, it was really, so I'm not going to summarize it. You, you just, you Well, listen, Columbo's, uh, you know, the whole Columbo thing's emotional to me because I lost my dad in 2019. His favorite show was Columbo. I used to remember watching with him as a kid. I think I was the remote control. I just changed the channels. <laughs> but if anyone wants to understand selling, Columbo, I think, is the greatest fictional salesperson ever. He's okay with being on okay. He does need to look sharp and the best dressed. No power suits. He looks real. It diffuses tension. That makes people feel comfortable when you're a little on okay. And the other thing is he does, he understands that asking the questions creates control, not the person talking. So salespeople who are product pushers do all the talking, they're not in control. Columbo let the questions do the power and he just listened. Now you're in control. Columbo, amazing salesperson. I don't know, Kevin Casey, I think there's a book in you. <laughs> Let's hope not. For I, another show. Yeah, of course, <laughs> I, I hope so. It's gonna be a short book. Thank you so much for I being with us it, today. I enjoyed it, Lynn, it's great it's to see you again. It's always a pleasure. For sure, we'll see you again. Absolutely. Yellow business card. Oh, never again. Okay. <laughs> and we'll be right back after these messages. It all started when I racked up some serious debt. Interest payments were going up, creditors were calling. Jane's and Noseworthy came up with a plan. Knowing that the phone was gonna stop ringing and that I was not in this alone was a huge relief. Bankruptcy or a consumer proposal or whatever help you get is not the end. It's just the beginning. A chance to start again with knowledge and support and people in your corner. Are you ready? Get out of debt. It's okay. Learn more about Leah's story at janesnosworthy.ca.
hope you enjoyed our conversation tonight with Kevin Casey and learned a little bit about selling and unselling. Join us next time on Out of the Fog. about this